When we think of AI in video today, we probably think of generative AI, typing out a text prompt and generating a complete video or turning one existing video into something completely different. There's actually a much more practical use of AI happening right now that is changing the way we're making movies, from transcription to tagging to even potentially relighting a scene. In this video, I'm going to explore how AI is changing the way we make movies today. You're watching VP Land. Special thanks to our sponsors for helping make this video possible, Blackmagic and Atomos. In this video, we'll take a look at how AI is being built into the video tools we use, how it might change traditional filmmaking workflows, and how the practical uses of AI aren't just reserved for computer tasks, but can even change how we light and record a movie. But with the potential of AI taking over more and more tasks and potential jobs, we'll try to answer the question, will more creative work be done by humans or AI? And we'll offer some tips on how you can stay ahead of the shift and utilize AI to work faster and better. AI is not going to take your job. The person who uses AI well might take your job. But for right now, let's take a look at the current landscape of filmmaking tools and how AI is actually not that new. Utility AI has been around forever. I mean, if you've ever done any kind of like video editing or sound editing, there's all kinds of little AI meditata kind of tagging that happens in mm. the background. That's Noah Kadner, the virtual production editor of American Cinematographer magazine and a technologist who's been tracking the latest tech and media production for a long time. And I don't think that's ever been controversial. Like nobody's like, oh, this thing logged all my footage for me and tagged people's faces. Like, I'm upset about this. Yeah, I'm upset about this. It's <laughs> taking my time, yeah. I mean, sure, if you were like a really low level assistant, I suppose you could be like, well, I could have done that, but other than that. Let's take a quick look back at AI and our video editing tools. This actually goes way back, nearly 20 years ago in 2007, when Avid first introduced Script Sync, which would synchronize your raw footage with its respective spot in the script. In 2011, Final Cut Pro X was released. Love it or hate it, it completely rethought what a timeline and metadata should be like, and included some AI under the hood, like automated color balance and auto-classifying shot types. In 2019, Blackmagic introduced their Neural Engine, which enabled tools like facial recognition and speed warp. So AI has been around for a while, but everything we just mentioned is inside the editing tools. And that creates a lot of new workflow issues because there are a lot of people involved in the filmmaking process, especially the post-production process, who are not the editor and they don't need to be in a non-linear editing program or NLE. I understand how much value there is in transcribing in an NLE, but I think the NLE is the wrong place to transcribe. That's Michael Cioni, co-founder of Strata on our podcast back in January. We'll talk more about Strata in a moment. If you have departments, you have different people, I don't think it's fair to dump transcription on the cutting room because they got other problems there. And they need to be cutting, not transcribing. Right now, for the bulk of AI tasks and video, we're treating it like a plugin, something we apply to our footage once it's in our editing program, like cleaning up the audio or denoising a video. I also just mentioned specific AI features in specific NLEs, but the reality is you'll probably be using a variety of tools and models depending on what you need to do. You might want to send archival footage to Topaz AI because they have better models specifically for that task, or you might want to send a video clip to Runway to erase an object or a logo. I've also been mentioning AI models a few times, we'll break those down in a moment. But what if, instead of thinking of AI as a post-production or editing task, we move it earlier in the process, to the moment right after we stop recording? So I went to find out. We are here at NAB. This is a huge trade show where every company involved in media entertainment is showing up and showing off what's new. We're going to talk to a bunch of companies and a bunch of experts to kind of find out how they're actually incorporating AI today into their tools, into their hardware, figure out how it's actually applying to things we're using today and not theoretical stuff. So we're going to go talk to some people figure out what's happening. One person who is rethinking workflows with AI is someone we just met, Michael Cioni. Michael has a long history in rethinking media workflows, from his first startup LightIron to developing Frame.io's camera to cloud integration, to now focusing on utility AI with Strata. So Strata is a cloud workflow platform that's powered by AI. We're using AI to do the mundane and boring tasks like syncing and sorting and searching and transcoding and transcribing and analyzing and translating. And that's where I think the best parts for creative people are, is to automate the boring stuff so that we can do the creative stuff faster. One thing you did mention uh, when you were here last year, you're like, you're looking around and you were like, that can be replaced by AI, that can be replaced by AI. When you're looking around now, what are you seeing? Same thing, different thing? It's the same thing. 
what we're seeing right now is yes, there, there's a lot of technology that can be automated. If you can see um, a task that someone can do over and over and over in your ecosystem of your products, that's the one that you should evaluate. Can AI remove that task entirely, right? And that's where I see some companies the entire company could go away or a portion of it, or they could make their product better by integrating an AI component that automates a part that used to be a little bit slower. But you see, you feel like with a lot of the sort of AI tools that now it's sometimes like a, a fragmented, like yeah. in order to do what you want to do, you got to like bounce around between so many different tools. How is Strata addressing that? And sort of yeah. how do you think about that in the future? So I would say one of the largest problems with AI tools in general is they're not built by subject media, subject matter experts in this industry. If you talk to an engineer that has a cool AI tech and you say, how does it work with log and ACES color and it has to work with you know, intra-frame encoding. They're gonna be like, I don't know what you just said. And we're like, well then I can't use it because all that matters to how we work here. And so we need to be thinking about that. And so at Strata, we're building our own orchestration layer and we built a custom orchestration layer and a custom AI engine. Even though we don't make all the AI, we bring in models, we power those models. Ferrari does not make every part in the motor. They don't make the tires. They don't make their own rubber gaskets, right? But they assemble it in a device that people say that is special. There's something about that because of the custom stuff around the off-the-shelf stuff. Strata builds the, cu the custom stuff is the hardest stuff that only a subject matter expert would know to do and then we could take other people's AI and make it work for our industry. Strata is rethinking where the media and organization is happening, moving it out of the editing tools and into a separate platform that more people can collaborate on, right after production, before editing starts. And hopefully we're building a tool simple enough that it's not built for editors, it's built for everyone, writers, producers, directors, post soups, VFX soups, certainly editors, but we're trying to make a tool that doesn't require you to need to go to YouTube and learn how to use it before you can figure out how to take advantage of it. Strata also introduces the idea of being a platform where you can bring your own AI models to do the specific tasks that you need done. Every project will have different needs, and there is no one-size-fits-all answer. Another company that is taking the same approach is Axel AI. And, and what it does is it catalogs the material, and then it feeds them into our AI engines that do things like face recognition, scene understanding, object and logo recognition, even numbers and characters on screen, and transcription. And then it puts all that in a big database that you can search. That's Sam Bogash, CEO of Axel AI. And are these uh, AI models, are these ones that uh, Axel AI developed? Yes. The majority of it is developed in-house and deployable on-premise by our customers. So the idea is it's a platform that you can extend because AI is evolving so rapidly, we don't claim to have all the answers. And so how is this sort of set up? Is it sort of like if you need some models for identifying faces, you can do that, but maybe if you don't need another model, you don't have to get that model? Correct, it's a la carte, and then we're also doing some specialized ones, like one example is sports highlights. We're a generalist company, 25 people. We're unlikely to ever develop like a sports highlight module, mm -hmm. but we have partners who do, and so we can plug those in, or sophisticated audio processing, right? So dubbing, automated dubbing. Again, not something we're gonna do, but our partners do. So you can plug those in and get the benefits of AI around our core platform. Now, we've been talking a lot about models. Let's take a step back for a second. What are models? A model is when you give the computer a bunch of data and train it to perform a task. We'll talk about using generative AI for images and video in our next episode, but when it comes to LLMs or large language models, we recently learned that if we give these models a lot of data, it can make better outputs. That's when ChatGPT had its breakout moment using OpenAI's GPT-3 model and now their GPT-4 and GPT-4 Turbo model. There's also Anthropic's Claude model, their most recent advanced model being Claude 3 Opus. But one of the issues with these large models is that they've just been trained on massive amounts of text data. Even when they're trained on podcasts or videos, it's the transcripts from that media that they're trained on. So when new apps pop up that say they'll write chapters for your YouTube videos or summarize video, they're really just looking at the transcript of your video to create those outputs. That's fine if your video is a podcast or an interview, but what if your video is, you know, a video that's more than just talking heads? 
How can we use AI to help us understand our video content, whether it's in the editing process and we need to search through hours of B-roll, or we have a large media library and we want to make highlight reel out of hundreds of hours of footage? We need newer models that are specifically trained for video. There are a few companies focusing on this problem. There's Imaginario, founded by Jose Puga, whom we've had on the podcast. And then there's 12 Labs. We talked to their co-founder, So Young Lee. Where, where did the idea come behind this to start training your own models around this? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I think for video, uh, it's been neglected in terms of mm -hmm. in the AI world a little bit where traditionally, uh, because it's so difficult to understand video data, it would be kind of misrepresented as an image problem or a text problem. From the start of the company and the, from kind of where we started building out the research and tech stack, uh, we wanted to build from inception large models that are born to understand video data. And just like humans, if you can understand the world around you uh, and hear and have that perception understanding, uh, that means this scales to any other modality as well. So if you can understand video really well, you can understand audio, image, and language really well. Like by understanding video, you can kind of reverse it and get better understandings out of other media formats? Exactly. So 12Ops uh, builds multimodal video foundation models that can understand everything inside your video. So basically what that means is we build AI models that can have human level understanding of any video, including visuals, sounds, language, temporal understanding. Put all of this together and contextualizing the video, then you can do really cool things like describe any scene in everyday language, find exact time segments across hundreds of thousands of hours of video, uh, but you can also generate language on top of the video. So generating summaries, descriptions, also okay. free-form prompt-based question answering. If we get into like the more technical side of things, how uh, the, found the foundation model stack is built, uh, where everything revolves around multimodal understanding. It's not just about what objects are there, but the relationships between objects, people, entities within a moment, um, how moments are connected over time, how things change, mm -hmm. because that determines our stories. Putting all of this modalities together um, to understand, to create that understanding. And I think that's how our technology is represented. Unlike the other companies we've talked about, 12 Labs is built to be in the background. They're building a model that any platform can connect to and analyze the media wherever it's hosted, from online storage like AWS and Backblaze, to recently announced integrations like with Blackbird's online video editor and Massive. Uh, for us, we, especially for 12 Labs, we focus on providing all the best rich understanding of data that you have. You know, what we believe is that if you have ability to know exactly and leverage all of the data that you, all of the video library assets that you have, um, that, you know, that opens up a lot of doors to different toolkits. Um, but our basically our, what we want to do is like help power the workflow where you can actually focus on the creative storytelling aspect of things and not having to, you know, log or you don't have to go back and you know, actually rewatch and scrub through content. It's uh, the speed of iteration, um, of the creative iteration that you can go through. Uh, if you're thinking something in your mind and you want to see a rough cut of it or you want to put together a draft of it, you can actually do that very quickly with the help of AI. Um, and I think that augmentation and helping with that process is kind of where we, uh, where we focus on. And it's not just large video libraries that are getting their own AI models. Opus Clip is one of many online clip generators that will automatically splice up your long-form video, like a podcast, into short clips for sharing on TikTok, Instagram Reels, and YouTube Shorts. I had initially thought they were another ChatGPT rapper that was just looking at the transcript and making guesses on what it thinks would be a good soundbite. But it turns out there's a lot more going on under the hood, including their own specially trained AI models. How is it determining what it thinks is viral? We built a model off of reviewing over 5 million different shorts that were out there on the internet. We also hired professional short form editors to go out there and clip things well and then clip things badly and try to trick the AI in different ways. And over time, the AI got really clever and really good at judging what is a good short form clip, what is a bad short form clip. And then we had another AI that got really good at actually doing the physical clipping. And then they basically battle every time while you're waiting okay. uh, and argue so with each other. So you your own models good. for these using exactly. like, giving it a bunch of clips, like these are good clips. Yeah, so we built, clips like we built a clipping model and then we built a judge model. Okay. And then the judge yells at the clipping model and tells it needs to do a better job until the clipping model does a good enough job that the judge model says, okay. Now, we've been talking a lot about AI being used in post-production and moving things back to right after we stop recording. But what if we can use AI even during production? We saw a few examples of this at NAB. DJI released the Focus Pro, which uses LiDAR to scan the environment and AI to detect and track faces and objects and lock focus on them. 
Move AI is using iPhones to create markerless motion tracking. We also saw this from Mosis with their new mo capture system. And we even saw AI inside a cinema camera. If the lens isn't providing data, metadata, or just it doesn't. Right. Okay. It doesn't matter whether it does or it doesn't. We're able to, to exude it through a little AI uh, By doing this software. calibration the first time. Correct. And then what if AI completely changes how we capture and light a scene? One of the more mind-blowing demos I saw was Switchlight. Switchlight can take your footage and completely relight your scene. So right now what's happening is every pixel in the HDRI is working as a light source. So it's doing the relighting. And it's also working as a background. So we can change the HDRI and see that it works. It looks as if this person is in a completely different environment. So you can basically think of as having a LED virtual product wall, mm -hmm. but at like 100 times less cost. That's Hoon Kim, founder of Beeble, the company behind Switchlight. Is there sort of a minimal quality you need in the source video in order to get a good uh, output with the lighting? That's a very good question. The best setting we recommend is the just flat white light because that way we'll have the most information from the 2D footage. So, I mean, do you feel like this might shift how sets are lit in the future, where it's like, oh, maybe we'll just go with a softer, flatter light because we'll be able to tweak it later in post? Yeah, so right. that's what I dream. I think AI is going to change everything. Basically, artists want to deliver their content as fast and as easy as possible without spending tons of money. Mm -hmm. And I think a very good way to do that is doing maybe everything in post-production. We'll talk more about how lighting and production are changing in our video on virtual production. So the vibe you might be getting with how AI is changing the way we make movies today is one person can now do what might have taken 10 people to do in the past. But then that leaves the obvious question. What about those nine other people that are now out of work? I talked to Phil Galler about this at VIEW's Virtually Everything Summit, which took place before NAB, where he gave a talk on the future of storytelling tech. Phil's been at the forefront of cutting-edge filmmaking tech. His company, Lux Machina, was behind the original virtual production volume for The Mandalorian, along with a ton of other projects. The job thing. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, one of the examples you gave, and this is how I felt too, or it's like, it will enable like something that might, might have taken 10 people. Yeah. Like one person could do what a team of 10 would yeah. do. Which, when you do that math, you're like, okay, well, nine people yeah. seem to be out of work. Yeah. But then you're like, we're going to be making a Way lot more, more contact and exactly. a lot for a lot more platforms. So can you expand on like? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I look at it like there's there's five thousand projects right now, and there's a hundred people doing five thousand projects. There's fifty thousand projects. We can do it with the same number of people. Or we can do it with less people, but we more people that are spread across all those projects. Look, right now you've got an iPhone, you probably have an iPad, you probably got a TV, right? <laughs> Soon you're going to have devices everywhere. I've seen them make content for that. And they're going to have to make, I have opportunities to tell stories in that kind of environment. They're going to be, um, I think, you know, in the future, there are going to be a number of wearable devices that we have that have screens in them. And so now it's not just about telling stories in a 16 by nine format or in VR. It's about connecting all those things. So we're having a truly seamless experience. When you put down your phone, you get to transition that experience into another medium, right? And I think I look at that going, well, like, that's a huge opportunity. We're going to need hundreds and hundreds more artists um, working on those projects, right? So how do we make them more efficient so that we can spread that load across all the work that needs to get done? And to me, it's, it's supply and demand, right? It's increased demand. It means we need to have more people doing that work, and we have to get more efficient, right? And that we might be using AI to leverage accelerating exactly. the creation of yeah. these yeah, and stories, I think, these assets, whatever we need to make it. Hundred percent. And I think you know, I I think that yeah, the low hanging fruit right is AI that can help us make an asset, or we make an asset and we give it to an AI. The you know some kind of algorithm, it's machine learning really, machine learning algorithm that goes, oh well, here's the game ready asset, here's the VR ready asset, here's mm -hmm. the high quality asset. And I think that's like for me it becomes a bit. I don't say reductive because it sounds negative, but I think that is the lowest hanging fruit. And now back to the original question. Will more creative work be done by humans or AI? I don't think it's an either or question. I think it's a continuum, a continuum of human, AI, or nothing. Will AI be able to perform a task as well as a human, especially creative tasks that are a bit more subjective, like color timing a film or mixing a soundtrack? No, at least not right now. But a lot of times, hiring someone isn't even an option. There's no budget, or the existing team doesn't have the expertise, so that task just doesn't get done, or it gets done so it's good enough. 
Maybe you apply a LUT to your movie instead of sending it to a colorist. AI can fill that gap and make good enough even better. I mean, but do you feel like, I guess where is that, like Axel AI, maybe it replaces uh, someone that might have been a footage logger, but do you feel like it opens up more possibilities for someone who might have just had a pile of footage anyways that they were going to hire someone? Exactly, much more the latter. In fact, the, the idea that you were ever going to be able to hire enough interns to log, like, petabytes of footage, <laughs> it's just a non-starter, right? At Linus Tech Tips just did a video mm -hmm. on us, and turns out they have two petabytes of footage for a YouTube channel. Yeah. No one's ever gonna log that, so this idea that we're putting someone out of work, it's like, nah, what it really means is they can get back into their material and reuse it better, and I, I think our application in particular is, is clearly not about taking jobs, it's about making the few people that focus on this a lot more productive. A lot of people have the fear that AI is going to steal their job or it's going to somehow make them redundant or what I'm seeing is it's, you know, ultimately becoming one more tool in the toolbox that people who are able to sort of get past all that and leverage it well are going to, you know, do very well in the biz and people that are saying, oh, it's not going to be good for you, like, yeah, probably not going to be great for them. So let's recap. How is AI changing how we're making movies today? We'll be able to do more with less, whether that's a smaller budget or a smaller team or both. We'll have to rethink what the filmmaking workflow looks like. This ranges from new tools and platforms to analyze and sort and transcribe our footage before it even gets to the editing stage, to developing new AI models designed for specific filmmaking needs. And we'll need to be open to adopting these new ways of working. This ties into how can you stay ahead of this AI shift. AI is not going to take your job. The person who uses AI well might take your job. Keep learning. With YouTube and all of the free resources out there, it is way easier to learn new tools, especially if you are just starting out. Experiment. Most of these tools are free or very inexpensive. It is extremely easy to just try them out, get your hands dirty, test them out on a project, get working. And lastly, question every step of your process. Look at each task that you do in the filmmaking process and ask yourself, what can be automated? What can I try to give to AI? And since we're at the end of the video, it's time for me to plug VP land. If you'd like to stay on top of new AI developments and follow the latest trends and insights and new tech that is changing the way we are making movies, hit the subscribe button and also check out our newsletter, vp-land.com. We've got more videos like this coming out, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss them. Or if they are already out, check out the playlist and continue watching right here. Also, please give this video a thumbs up and let me know in the comments what you thought. Agree? Disagree? Did I miss something? Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.